Oh, hello. It's your number one fat Asian. And the sun has set on yet another glorious Euros. The king of the colonizers has finally been crowned. But before we jump too far ahead, let us take a look back on the magical month that it was in Germany. Full of excitement, action, and more young explosive talent than OnlyFans. And much like the ladies of OnlyFans, before we get into this, I need to pay some bills. Hey guys, you're number one fat Asian. And sadly, with the Euros over, it's time to start burning off all them snacks and brewskis you've been throwing back for the past month. And what's gonna help turn this fat Asian into the skinny Asian is of course, factor meal plans. Listen, I've been on a fitness kick since the start of the summer. I know you're supposed to start before the summer, but I'm lazy. But even through the Euros, over the past month, I've been able to lose about eight pounds. And honestly, I don't think I would have lost as much weight if I didn't have factor. Because I know me, it's, it's just so easy that when you're exhausted after a workout, after work, and then you feel the craving, the calling to the void. I just do it. That Uber Eats order of Mickey D's, it's gonna cost me $37. Ugh. Brother, ugh. What's that? What's that, brother? But then I remember, oh yeah, I have I have Factor in my fridge. And all I have to do, pop a few holes in that bitch, put it in the microwave for three minutes, and then I'm eating in less time than it would take for me to complete my Uber Eats order. And hey, if you're tired, you're exhausted, you got Factor. You can say fuck it at cooking, fuck it at groceries, fuck it at cleaning it up. With Factor, you get fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. And with 35 different selections and 60 different add-ons every week, you'll never get bored. And also, if you want to add a little fancy pants to your life, you can check out the Gourmet Plus. Get a little surf and turf in your life, or my personal favorite, the filet mignon with the broccolini. For less than a meal at Chick-fil-A, you could be eating filet mignon with broccolini. Why are you not eating filet mignon with broccolini? Simply, they're great. I've been subscribing to them for over a year. I'm never going back. And if you want to make your life a little bit more efficient, then you owe it to yourself to try out at least one box. So please, go to Factor75.com and use the code FATASIAN50 at checkout. You get 50% off your first box and 20% off your following month. So yes, once again, go to Factor75.com or click on the link below and use code FATASIAN50 at checkout to get 50% off your first box and 20% off the following month. Thank you once again to Factor for sponsoring this video. Now, back to the show. Oh, and real quickly, follow me on IG, at the Fat Asian. All right, so let's talk about what went down in the group stages. The atmosphere in Germany was fantastic. Predictably, the Germans were excellent hosts. Everything ran as scheduled, which cannot be said about the Copa America. Soccer fans without tickets stormed past the gates of the Hard Rock Stadium on Sunday. But Euro 2024 started off with a bang, with the hosts beating the shit out of Scotland. My God, it was a 5-1 massacre. And I know you see the score, it was 5-1, but the Scots didn't even score a goal. The Germans scored every single goal in this game. Rudiger just felt bad for the Scots and scored an own goal for funsies. But yeah, this was just an open showcase on why Jamal Musiela and Florian Wirtz are the future of German football, if not the future of football. They look fantastic. The hosts look like liquid sex on the pitch. A dazzling display that would set the tone for the rest of the tournament. As for the Scots, I mean, they were pretty much toasted after game one. Yeah, having a negative four goal differential in one of your games is uh, gonna get you the boot pretty quickly from this tournament. But while they might have had not much joy on the pitch, no one had more fun off the pitch during the group stages than the Scots. Let's go ahead and take a look back at some of their best moments. <laughs> But that wasn't the only bang in the opening salvo of this tournament, as Mbappe decided to bang his face right into a defender's shoulder and break his nose. Yes, the newly minted Madrista would have to wear a mask for the rest of the tournament. And the first image we saw of it did not disappoint. I present to you the French Ninja Turtle. Now almost every time, regardless of the sport, whenever a player like breaks their nose or shatters like an eye and they're forced to wear the athletic face mask, it tends to give them a buff. They go on these tremendous legendary runs and that kind of becomes their image. The most recent one that comes to memory is Victor Osimhen when he won the league with Napoli. So we all thought that Mbappe donning the mask, that it would lead to yet another one of these legendary runs. I mean, come on. He looked like the best player at the last World Cup, but I think he made a mistake. Instead of going with the red, white, and blue mask, he opted for the chic, sexier black mask. And from that point on, 
The mass didn't give him any aura. He gave him negative aura. Yeah, it was like that one deep up mass in Baldur's Gate. And he honestly played like shit every time he wore it. But it wasn't totally his fault. Just all of France kind of look like shit during this tournament, at least offensively. And this is weird because them and England were the two favorites heading in. But defensively, France were on point. William Saliba, I, I don't think there's an argument right now. He's probably the best defender in the world. And Golo Conte apparently took a sensu beam before this tournament. This is one play during the group stages that a France defender completely fucks it. The guy's in on net, and Golo Conte comes flying in from the midfield, tracks all the way back, and snuffs out the attack before he even gets a shot off. What is this man doing in Saudi Arabia? Someone signed him, but these were the only real highlights for France. They somehow made it out of the group stages without scoring a single goal from open play. They had a penalty and two own goals. Own goals was their top scorer, but I mean, we're gonna be honest, generational tournament for own goals. Euro 2024, own goals ran away with the golden boot at this tournament. But now let's talk about the other disappointing favorites coming into this tournament, England. Yes, they opened this tournament as the betting favorites, and who could blame them? They had a star-studded cast, Champions League winners, Premier League winners, La Liga winners, and Harry Kane. On paper, no other team could even compare, but I knew. I knew even before the tournament started. It's a trap! England scored early in their opening match, and then played like absolute dog shit for about 97% of the tournament. Somebody smell like shit! Somebody smell like shit! <laughs> Undoubtedly, Gareth Southgate's brand of football terrorism will leave an indelible mark on this tournament. From playing Bakayo Saka at left back, or trying Trent Alexander-Arnold out in the midfield, or deciding to not use Cole Palmer, his best player, until the third game of the group stages. It was simply near unbearable to watch. Unless you were hate watching. And then it was, it was fantastic. It was so good. But now on a more serious note, I don't want to talk about it, but I do have to talk about it. There were some fan on fan violence at this tournament. So to everyone who is, is sensitive to this type of thing, and especially my Italian fans, I think you should look away. As before the Albanian Italian match, some Albanian fans were filmed and they had the Italians on their knees begging for their lives, but the Albanian fans would not listen. And they cruelly snapped a bundle of spaghetti right in front of the Italian fans. Devastating. Yeah, this moment would end up going viral, and it sparked what I'm gonna call the food wars of Euro 2024. A lot of people made signs, some Austrian fans were filmed snapping a baguette in front of French fans before their match. And overall, I mean like, yes, there actually was some fan-on-fan -fan violence, but I mean, what Euros doesn't have fan-on-fan -fan violence? Overall, the vibes were immaculate in Germany. And there was one local folk hero who rose through prominence via TikTok. Known by most as a German sexy sax man, he brought cheer and good vibes everywhere he went. By the end of it, he was such a celebrity, he had to have his own security. I don't know who this man is, but he was fantastic. And everywhere the Germans went, he was there, buffing the team like a bard in Baldur's Gate. Oh man, yeah, it was just good times in the group stages. We were spoiled to three games a day. Every match was pretty much a banger, unless it was France or England. Even small teams came out of nowhere to give us sizes. Hungary subbed on this Viking to play striker. Look at this absolute unit of a man. He plays in South Korea. Adam, Adam, you're my new favorite. Not football, you're my new favorite person. Arda Guler scored a wonder goal, becoming the youngest player to ever score in Euros history. But uh, let's just say there's, there, there's a little bit more of that to come. But yeah, fantastic tournament for the young Turk. Showed extremely well. God, look at the Real Madrid roster. Yeah, I'm gonna steal the meme. This is the type of greed they talk about in the Bible. But for as much fun as we're having the group stage, there weren't any like blockbuster matchups. You know what I'm talking about? Like no big nation versus big nation. The only clash of titans that we had was defending champions Italy versus España. And the defending champions did not look good all tournament. While La Roja on the other hand, scintillating. Oh man, they came out of the gate a well-oiled machine. Their typical tiki taka style lent to a cohesion that not a lot of teams had at this tournament if I'm gonna be honest. And I like Spain going into the tournament, but I did not anticipate that they would have two major X factors up top for them. Yeah, those wingers. Those two wingers are something special. At this point, everybody knows about the supremely talented Lamine Yamal. The announcers couldn't stop talking about how he was a 16-year-old, he was baptized by football Jesus, and he had a fantastic season for broke-ass Barcelona. He was Spain's best player, he would routinely cook anybody he was left on an island with. Yes, we know, he's really good. But the bigger surprise was the winger on the left side. Nico Williams, whose combination of pace and skill gave Spain a mini Mbappe out on the wing. And with that type of dynamism in their squad, they gave the pass you to death, they had special players that could make something out of nothing. It just seemed like they always had an extra gear than every other squad in Germany. Coming out of the group stages, it was pretty much Spain and Germany, with Portugal being a distant third in who looked the best. But ultimately, the group stages would end 
on a rather somber note, as the Croatians, who were better than the first match by Spain, had recovered throughout the group stages and only needed to beat the defending champions Italy to make it into the knockouts. And all was going according to plan. Luka Modric had somehow scrambled the goal in. They were leading 1-0. They were into injury time. There were mere seconds left on the clock. They had defended so well the entire game. But then, on the final counterattack of the game, you could feel, with Luka Modric biting his kid on the bench, that something terrible was about to happen. And on that fateful counterattack, the pressure got to the Croatians. The defense was all out of sorts. And a ball would play an Italian attacker through, and it would shape a perfectly placed shot that would shatter Croatian hearts around the world. And would give us this, the most devastating image from Euro 2024. This is Luka Modric receiving the Man of the Match award after his country was eliminated in the dying moments of the group stages. He looks like someone took his dog out back and shot him and made him watch. And finally, we're at the knockouts. In the first match on the docket, we're defending Champions Italy versus the Swiss. And these sneaky neutral bastards. They'd done it again. In the group stages, Zerdan Shakiri scored his banger, which he always seems to score at every major tournament that he plays in. While Switzerland, with their above average roster, had became the fashionable dark horse of this tournament. While Italy looked like they were playing on borrowed time. And honestly, it took a historic collapse from the Croatians in order for them to get this far. And thankfully, the Swiss put the pretender king out of their misery. Italy, thanks for coming. You can take your broken spaghetti and go home. Next on the easy side of the bracket was England versus Slovakia. And England, who looked dickless in the group stages, would copy paste that template into the knockouts. In fact, Slovakia would be the ones that found the opener. And for 89 minutes, England looked completely rudderless. And all signs were pointing to an absolutely embarrassing exit in the round of 16. But then in the dying moments of the game, off of a corner, Jude Bellingham hits a fucking bicycle kick. This dude scored a goal in the Oprah and had done fuck all the rest of the tournament. And then he goes and does this and totally redeems himself. A goal that will be immortalized on little English boys' walls for the next 10 years. And honestly, he doesn't deserve it. G get a better idol. Kids, put Le Mean Mall up there. But anyway, England force extra time and the substitute Ivan Tony knocks the ball down right into the path of Harry Kane who drives a bullet header home. And England, by the skin of their teeth, somehow survive. And there was my trendy dark horse, Portugal versus Slovenia. Quick pop quiz, which flag is Slovenia and which flag is Slovakia? The answer is no one really cares. But Portugal, again, look fantastic as you can be for a team that takes it to extra time. Yeah, I don't know how they didn't score in that game. But in that period of extra time, Diego Jota gets taken down in the box. The VAR monster gives it as a pen and up steps Penaldo. And he fucking misses. It's not the greatest pen from him. And the Slovakians take it to the halftime of extra time and during that halftime, we get one of the most iconic images coming out of this Euros, which is near 40-year-old Ronaldo just crying his fucking heart out. The man is sobbing uncontrollably. He has to be consoled by Bruno Fernandes, by his various teammates. They're trying to pick him up, but the man looks like a girl whose boyfriend just dumped her. And honestly, kind of an endearing moment. We kind of look at Ronaldo as this hyper machismo, selfish, arrogant player. But when it comes down to it, the fucker just wants to win. And you gotta respect that. The Slovenians drag it out to pens. And when it comes to pens, who would you favor? The hardened Eastern Bloc boys who just don't give a fuck? Or the fair weather pretty boys of Portugal? I know who I thought was gonna win. But in that penalty shootout, the first person to step up for Portugal, Ronaldo. And no fear, he widens his stance, takes his big signature breath, does a dome in expansion, and redeems himself. And you could see the relief that came off of this man. He set the tone for his team as Bruno Fernandes and Bernardo Silva followed up to make it a perfect 3-0 for Portugal to start out. And then their keeper, Diago Costa, would don the cape and play hero as he went perfect sell, a perfect 3-0, saving all three penalties, a first in Euro's history to complete a perfect 3-3 three three for penalties for Portugal. Once again, another first in European history. And the Portuguese escape embarrassment in the round of 16 as well. And Ronaldo's last dance gets another night on the European stage. Next was France versus Belgium. France were not at their best in this game. I mean, they, they haven't been at their best the whole tournament, but it still was enough to get past the biggest paper tiger in international football, Belgium. Now, I haven't talked about Belgium up until now because honestly, I thought they'd be a waste of time. And this tournament proved me right as they continue their legacy of being the stinkiest golden generation of my lifetime. Just wasting the likes of Kevin De Bruyne, Lukaku, Dries Mertens, Diba Cochois, and now Jeremy Doku, with all that talent and being third in the FIFA World Rankings, has earned them diddly squat. While France find a way through to the next round, the only way they know how, 
by scoring yet another own goal. Next was Spain versus Georgia. And it was actually Georgia who took the lead early on in Spain. They looked a little bit rattled, actually. But then the Spaniards collected themselves, dialed in, and then put four past the Georgians. <laughs> yeah, it was like a little brother versus big brother moment right there. And it showcased that when they needed to, Spain could just take it to another level. Germany's summer fairy tale got rained on in Dortmund. Yes, a menacing thunderstorm postponed the game for about 45 minutes, and maybe it was a premonition, as Denmark gave them everything they got. And early on, they found the opener before the VAR monster came to the defense of the host twice. First ruling off a Danish goal, and then minutes later, awarding a penalty for the Germans. They go ahead and convert, and then late in the match, Musiala hits him on a counter to make it 2-0 and book themselves a date with Spain in the next round. The Netherlands pretty much just spammed Cody Gakpo to get past Romania. It must be said that Gakpo has been one of the players of this tournament, and honestly, we might have to look in if he has a twin. Because there is no fucking way this is the same guy who plays for Liverpool. A man named Cody was unstoppable this summer, and he showcased it against the hapless Romanians, just unplayable out on the left wing, slicing in and out, dazzling skill, twinkle toes on the byline to set up the second goal. He was more Brazil than Brazil was this summer, and his singular performance throughout this tournament had pretty much carried a rather pedestrian Dutch side all the way into the quarters. And that's where we stood, eight teams remaining. And unfortunately for most viewers, the first matchup is what we all consider to be the true final of Euro 2024, and Spain and Germany we're clearly the two best teams of this tournament. And there is like a 90% chance whoever won this is gonna go on and win the whole thing. And yeah, I would say it lived up to the hype. There was some sexy back and forth action. Spain, looking the more dangerous. Kai Havertz kept on getting into dangerous positions. And then he kept on doing what he's been doing all tournament long. Being completely helpless in front of that. At this point, I don't think this man could finish if he had a naked Dua Lipa in front of him, giving him JOI. If you're under 18, don't look that up. Don't. But if we're being honest, you filthy little fuckers probably know what it is. You're probably onto something way more degenerate. Spain finally find the breakthrough in the 52nd minute in the most Spanish way possible. Yeah, guess who? Lamine Yamal hits a perfectly weighted cutback and Danny Almo just passes it into the net. And it looked like España would nurse this 1-0 lead all the way to a victory until in the 89th minute. When the gracious host of this tournament said, we ain't going out like no bitch. And up steps Florian Wurz. And he conjures up some of that never losing black magic that he's been serving up all season long. And off of a goal mouse scramble, he equalizes for Deutschland. 1-1. And we all wondered, would there be yet another chapter written in the summer fairy tale for Germany? And that was the full 90. We go to two periods of extra time. And for the most part, it looked like it was going to go to pen. Which historically is in the Germans' favor. Because you know anything about Germans and pen. This motherfucker don't miss. But España proved why they're the best team in this tournament. And they didn't want to leave it up to the dice roll of the penalty shootout. Nah. In the 121st minute, Carver Hall hits a quality cross into the box. And of all people, Moreno comes out of nowhere pretty much and hits a header of perfection. It nestles into the top corner of the net. And just like that, La Roja has given the German summer fairy tale a grim ending. They move on. It's their tournament to lose. This trophy is pretty much in their hands right now. As for Germany, the curse of the host nation finally came to reap its tithe. But I, I think it's a good time to remind everyone that before this tournament even started, no one had Germany as the favorites, or even close to the favorites. In fact, this return to form has been a pleasant surprise, because ever since they won the World Cup in 2016, they've been sucking dick ever since. So hang your heads high, Germany. The future is bright. But really, because of extra time, we didn't really have a lot of time to process what we had just seen. Because a mere 20 minutes later, we had France versus my dark horse, and my $20 bet to win the whole thing in Portugal. Yeah, we were really spoiled to a football feast on Friday. And early on, France, France looked good. A lot more fluid than they had in the previous matches, but Portugal had the majority of possession. Rafael Liao was roasting Jules Koundé all game long. He was roasting pretty much everyone. The man was unplayable. Rafael Liao looked in this game the way people think Mbappe plays like. Just a mesmerizing combination of pace and skill. But speaking of the injured turtle, Mbappe had yet another forgettable appearance. The highlight was him getting hit in the face with the ball, and then he had to be subbed out because he hurt his boo-boo. But as for the rest of the match, long story short, we go the full 90, we get two extra periods, and for the second match in the row, Portugal is going to penalties. And you gotta think, Portugal is feeling kinda cocky when it comes to penalties. I mean, they just had a perfect penalty shootout in their last match. Three saved, three made, easy work. But this time, the hero, Diego Costa, didn't save a goddamn thing. And would come down to who blinked first. And you kind of knew. When Jao Felix stepped up, he was going to choke. Yeah, he didn't look confident. He pinged it off the post. And just continues his legacy of being one of the most overhyped wonderkins to come out in recent memory. 
And just like that, Ronaldo is sent to the retirement home. Abruptly, suddenly, violently, we have seen the last of one of the greatest players to ever kick a leather ball. This is history that we are witnessing. But more importantly, my $20 bet is ruined! Damn you, France! And yeah, stinky, stinky France somehow fall ass backwards into the semifinals. Without scoring a single goal from open play the entire tournament, it's been a penalty and two own goals. As the rest of Europe screams like Jesse Pigman, they can't keep on getting away with this. And then we get to the hate wash portion in the final eight. England versus Switzerland. In England, you did it again. Boring, lethargic, listless beans on toast football is here to stay apparently. Southgate's reign of football terrorism is forever. There wasn't a shot on target for either team until the 50th minute. But finally, the Swiss get it done. The quality shows through. They get a goal through Donald Beal and Bolo, but then only five minutes later, England once again get a star player to bail them out. This time it was Bakayo Saka, who, much like Jude Bellingham, had done pretty much fuck all the entire tournament, and then goes and shapes an inch-perfect shot into the box that kisses the inside of the post, and England have equalized. It's a goal that he scored many a time for Arsenal, and with only 10 minutes left in the game, they push it to extra time, and neither team really went for it. It's a tie. So we're going once again to pen. And at this point, you definitely think the Swiss are going to do it, because if you know anything about England and their history at major tournaments with pens, they're not very good. But the Swiss started off, Akanji steps up, and just hits the worst pen taken <laughs> at this tournament. God awful. Pickford gets an easy save, and that was it. Yeah, I was as shocked as you guys, because England won a perfect 5-0 and on their pens, including a no-look penalty by Ivan Tony. And with that Akanji miss, that pushes him to the next round. Piers Morgan is complimenting Saka on Twitter, which I'm pretty sure is one of the signs of the apocalypse. And this is a bit of redemption for England because at the last Euros, they went out on pens in the final. And with the number of black players missing those penalties, you know what social media did. Got really racist. But not this time, as many pointed out that all four black players made their pen. But this was swiftly corrected to remind people that it was all five. Real bad man, no in a shots. Straight jeans, cut off foot pants. But there you go. The Brexit boys are on to the semifinals. We're just playing the worst football we have seen in the Southgate era. And that's saying a lot. But anyway, let's talk about the last match. Netherlands versus Turkey. And this was a game that had fucking goals in it. After watching the two slog fest that was England and France advancing. This was a this was a little bit of a palate cleanser. And man, Turkey hats off Arda Guler. What a tournament this kid is having. Real Madrid, you you did well. You did well to snatch up this kid before this tournament because he would have cost a hundred million after this. And in this game, he does what he's been doing the whole entire tournament. Whips in an immaculate cross with his off foot, by the way, to put Turkey up 1-0. But in the second half, the Dutch they pour it on, they put the pressure, they strewn, they find the equalizer. And shortly after that, the most OP character in Smash, the Meta Knight of Euro 2024, enters the chat. And Cody Gakpo somehow finds another goal. I mean, it goes down as an own goal, but he pretty much scores this. And then the last 20 minutes of this match is just Max Holloway and Justin Gagey going to the center of the ring and just fucking slugging it out, throwing hands at each other. But in the end, only one can move on. Sadly, Turkey had to hit the deck. The Netherlands come from behind to advance and yeah, Cody Gakpo is just too OP, bro. And that was round of eight. Sadly, this is where all the Cinderella stories struck midnight. The Swiss and Turkey have been fantastic to watch this tournament. But now, it's only the Giga Chad nations that are left in the tournament of the colonizers. So let's get into the semi. France versus Espana. Mbappe opted to dump the debuff mask. And instantly, he gets an assist. Yeah, we didn't think it was possible, but France can actually score from open play. Unfortunately for France, though, Lamine Ball decides to respond by hitting the goal of the fucking tournament. Look at this thing. And from him. Ah, this is so annoying. And yes, Lamine Ball is excellent, but I've seen him play. This kid can't finish his homework, but he goes and he shapes an inch perfect floater to beat the superb mania. And oh my god, kissing the inside of the post. And anytime, anytime you hit woodwork or you hit a post, it's just more aesthetically satisfying. But once again, Spain proved that they're just different. And they've gone down plenty of times. It doesn't matter. The drums of revolution start playing. They go gear five Luffy. And with ease, they unlock France's vaulted defense. Danny Amo ties himself in the golden boot race, and it's 2-1 Espana. And this is mere minutes after Lamine Mall's wonder goal. We have to face facts. Spain are the main character of this tournament arc. And let's be honest, France have been living on borrowed time at the Euros. And two goals from open play was asking too much of them. La Roja, see it out, and football is healing. At least we're rid of one of the most boring teams to watch at this goddamn tournament. And this tournament has been excellent otherwise, except for two teams, France 
and England. So it's up to you, Netherlands. Yeah, the other semifinal was the Dutch versus the English. And I have to mention before we start, the Dutch have been one of the most entertaining fan bases to watch this summer. And this has been their signature move at the Euro 2024. Just look at it. 75,000 white people dancing in somewhat of a coordinated fashion. This right here, more impressive than the Lamini Mongol. But in the penultimate game of the tournament of the colonizers, we have the football terrorists of England versus the Netherlands, who've just been power spamming Cody Gakpo. Early on, the Dutch were in control. Tiny Shavi Simmons somehow powers Declan Rice off of the ball, drives toward the box, and then drops a power bomb past Pickford's tiny T-Rex arms to punch the Netherlands into the lead. And I was like, ooh, is this, is this where my hate watch ends? Because I'm crediting the announcers, they showed a graphic that in the semifinals of the Euros, teams are 19 and two when they score first. But then, England, and I'm not talking the shitty England we've seen all tournament. No, the England that we thought we were gonna see all tournament decides to show up. Collectively, they lean forward in their gamer chair and play the best fucking football they played all summer. Complete control, wave after wave of attack. The Dutch are overwhelmed, and finally, the dam breaks. Dumfries gives away a controversial penalty, and Harry Kane steps up, and he says, fuck it, to all this stutter step nonsense. Nah, King Kane gives it a proper meat pie smash, and we're all tied up, and the siege of the Netherlands continues. Kobe Mano slips in Phil Foden, who beats the young keeper of the Netherlands, only for Dumfries to redeem himself and stop the ball inches from crossing over the goal line. And let me tell you, the Dutch have never been happier to hear a halftime whistle. I gotta give them credit. A fantastic half of football. Finally, this is the England we have been waiting to see all tournament long. And coming out of halftime, England go right back to playing like dog shit. And it's just a slog through the second 45. And going to the 80th minute, it pretty much looks like for the third game in a row, England are gonna go to extra time. But then, Gareth Southgate, the football terrorist that he is, decides to take off Harry Kane to put on Ollie Watkins. It was a bit of a weird late game gambit. But if you look at the advanced metrics, Ollie Watkins is one of the most deadly accurate strikers when he's inside of the box. And what has Harry Kane been allergic to this entire tournament? Getting into the box. So Ollie Watkins comes on and what does he do? He runs into the box. Cole Palmer finds him and Ollie Watkins first touch of the game takes it away from the defender. And his second touch is a shot from a stupid angle. He needs to be perfect and he is. With his second touch of the game, he sends England into the final of Euro 2024. Gareth Southgate is the Joey Wheeler <laughs> of world football. He just throws random cards onto the field. His inner monologue is, I'm fucked. But somehow, he time wizards his way into beating Seto Kaiba. We don't know how they got here, but England, through sticking up this entire tournament, are now just one win away from it all coming home. How did this happen? Spain, on the other hand, had made it look easy the whole way. They've won in every way that you could ask for. Come from behind, no problem. Pass the team to death, easy work. Have a couple players that can make something happen out of nothing? Check, check, check. Yes, Spain is excellent. They should win. But that is not what is important. No, no. Good viewer, come closer. What's really important is that... Mm, mm, England fans are finally invested. Three dramatic wins in a row. At minimum, England fans are walking around mumbling. It's coming home. And at best, they're all in. I've seen the social media posts like, maybe, maybe we might win it. And that's all I need. That's all I need, baby. Because now, oh, it's gonna make it so delicious when this team breaks their country's heart again. The hate watch was always on England. And now, we have the final that this tournament deserves. It is beauty versus the beast. And as the game kicked off, I could tell they truly believed because I could hear the blood alcohol level in those English songs. Let's be honest, the first half wasn't so great. It was mostly England fending off the advances of Spain like a hot girl at a bar. But the second half, that's when things started kicking off. Rodri, the captain of Spain, was gonna be substituted off, supposedly for injury. This is obviously a big blow for Spain. He's the best defensive midfielder in the world. Everyone thought that, ooh, maybe England could take advantage of this. No, because two minutes out of the half, La Roja find the breakthrough. And through who else? You guessed it. Lamine Yamal skips away from Luke Shaw and places a perfectly weighted pass to his wingmate, Nico Williams, who runs onto it and slots it home between the legs of Jordan Pickford and Kyle Walker. There are two special players who've been making something out of nothing all summer long, do it again, and this time on the biggest stage of Europe. This 
is not your uncle Spain. Even the great Spanish teams of the Tiki Taka era never had the dynamism that Lamine Yamal and Nico Williams have given to the Spanish side. And this wombo combo of explosiveness caught England off guard. And now for the fourth knockout game in a row, England would have to try to come from behind. And Spain were ready to pounce. They had another excellent chance soon after. They could have been up 2-0 just five minutes after the restart. Something had to change, and Southgate went to roll the dice again. This time, taking off Harry Kane to bring on Ollie Watkins. England groaned to the game a little more. Southgate finally throws on Cole Palmer. And soon after, Bakayo Saka finds a little bit of space out on the wing on a counter. He cuts it back to Jude Bellingham. He lays it off gently for Cole Palmer to run onto it and just wrap his leg and have the ball scythe through a forest of Spanish legs. Unai Simon is slow to react, and in the blink of an eye, the ball is nestling in the back of the net. And as the parcher making throws up his signature too cold celebration, the England fans erupt. They're right back in it, believing. And why not? They've gone down in every single one of their knockout matches, and every single time, they've come back to win it. But none of those teams were as good as Spain. And just like Espana had done all tournament long, they flipped it into a higher gear. They went gear five losing, and with some intricate stuff at the top of the box, we would see a layoff to an unmarked Lamine Yamal who fires the shot on net. And what did I tell you? The goal he had against France? An illusion. For all the praises, he is not a natural finisher, as he flings the shot directly at Pickford, who parries it away, and England survives. But in many ways, it looked like England was just holding on, just trying to drag Spain into the deep end and take it to extra time, where it seemed like that England Harry Potter magic could possibly bring it home. The 86th minute came, and our counterattack for Spain sees Oreo Zabal play 1-2 to Kukurea, and the Chelsea fullback sends in a low driven cross, and old man Oreo Zabal somehow wrong sides Gaten. John Stones falls asleep keeping him on side, and Spain toe poke their way into the lead with four minutes of regulation remaining. For many teams, this would have been the end. But England have been living and dying by the last second heroics of their team. And this was not the final chapter. The 89th minute saw the three lines win a corner. Cole Palmer would take it, and he took it superbly. It swings in and finds that Declan Rice completely unmarked as he bullet headers it toward the net. There's such venom on it that Unai Simon can only parry it away. And only as far as Gehi, who once again heads it on target. Unai Simon is on the ground, helpless, as the ball barrels to an empty net. Only for Danny Almo to come off of the line and clear it with his paella noggin. But this time only as far as Declan Rice again, who gets his head on it a second time, only for the ball to sail harmlessly over the bar. This might have been the most important touch that he had all tournament. This singular clearance saved a certain goal for his country and put Spain back on top of the throne of Europe once again. And that was England's last chance. The whistle blew, and the best team at this tournament were crowned kings of Europe once again. Yes, La Roja were the best team at this tournament from start to finish. This new age Spain powered more through dynamism and speed while still incorporating their tiki-taka identity were just a class above everyone in this summer in Germany and will undoubtedly be a force to be reckoned with in world football for at least the next decade. As for England, theirs and Harry Kane's curse live on as the hate watchers received their magnum opus. Back to back European finals and back to back European final losses. Both different flavors of extraordinary heartbreaking fashion. But after the wounds start to heal, I think England fans can look back on this tournament and hang their heads proud. The lads, for all the terrorist ball that they played, also showed incredible grit. This England team simply would never die, coming back to win it multiple times, rescuing it at the death of the game, all the while under the immense pressure of both the British media and social media. And despite that intense crucible, they never faltered, not even till the end. This will be the end of Gareth Southgate's run with the three lions. And we're still a little bit too young in history to know how he will be remembered. For all his faults, he got them to the precipice twice. But in sports, we simply don't remember second place. That is the bitter truth of England and Southgate's tenure. As for La Roja, they're champions of Europe again. A record fourth time, they're unquestionably. They hold bragging rights over the rest of the colonizers. We're the best colonizer. And unlike Italy, they are a worthy ruler of the Iron Throne. In the end, Spain went Gear 5 Luffy and slew the unkillable beast Kaido. And in the process, freed the continent from football terrorism. And they did it all without racially abusing France. 
You see that? You see that, Argentina? That's how it's done. That's how it's done. A little bit of class. Yeah, if you don't know what went down in the Copa America this year, shit was ridiculous. I definitely have to do a video on it, but that's for another time. If you did enjoy, go ahead, smush your nipple into the like button right now. Also, follow me on IG. I'm trying to get to 10K at the Fat Asian Official. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to thank my editors, Lewis and Doc, for helping me edit this thing. If you want to hire either of them, I'll leave their contacts in the description down below. And as always, I'd like to thank all my patrons keep me alive and well. Special thank outs to everyone in the go tier. Elm, Robert Matai, it was cool meeting up with you. And yeah, until next time, boys, stay thick.